Welcome to How We Got Here, a genealogy podcast hosted by Brian Nash, exploring the tools, tips, and resources for genealogists from Atlantic Canada and family historians from around the globe who are researching their ancestors from Atlantic Canada. Every family has a story, so stick around as Brian and his guests share the unique family stories that help shape the history and culture of Atlantic Canada. Hi, I'm Brian Nash from How We Got Here Genealogy, and today on our podcast, I have Brendan Kumasari from Master Talk, and he's a, a little bit different type of a guest uh, that I am bringing on today. Um, I'm bringing him on to to talk about basically public speaking or um, and storytelling because that's one thing as genealogists I know that we often struggle with um, if we're called to a do a presentation at a genealogy society meeting or if we're just even trying to tell the story of our, tell our family story uh, on a, on an interview show like this or something else. It's, it's often, if it's not something you do regularly, you tend to struggle with. I, I know my, my myself, even though I, I do this regularly, I, I find often I find myself searching for word. Brandon will be talking about speaking in public. Brandon introduces himself and explain a little bit what he does and um, how it can help you. For sure, Brian. It's great to be here, man. So yeah, to your point, I'm the founder of Master Talk, which is a YouTube channel that I started to help people with their communication skills. And how I got started with Brian was when I was in college and university, I started doing these things called case competitions. Think of it like professional sports for nerds. Well, the guys my age are playing football or baseball. I was doing presentations competitively, and that's how I learned how to speak. And then as I got older, I started coaching a lot of the students on how to communicate ideas. And I just realized that a lot of the topics and tips I was sharing with them wasn't really available for free on the internet. So I just started making videos in my basement and I called the YouTube channel Master Talk. And then a few years later, here we are today. Great. Uh, so that's a, a, a great origin story of uh, how you got into it. I, I know that's often how the things we do in university sometimes that we do outside the classroom wind up being the things we wind up pursuing in in life more. Uh, so you were doing these these competitive speech contests in university, and then you you just from there you moved on to teaching it on the internet. Uh, you said your channel was called Master Talk, and it's on YouTube. Uh, so what type of things would you would, would you start with if a person's nervous about speaking in public or they just don't really know where to start? For sure, Brian. Absolutely. So here's the way I think about this. Communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time. So one of those balls is body language. One of them is storytelling. One of them is eye contact, facial expression, smiling, and the list goes on. So for me, the question has become, what are the three easiest balls to juggle in the year? Kind of like going to the gym. Like, sure, you could look at diet plans. You could look at calorie intakes. But walking 15 minutes a day is probably the best way to start working on your health. So now the question becomes, what are those three balls for communication? So let's start with ball number one that any genealogist listening to this can do at the comfort of their own home. They don't have to do it in front of people. And the exercise is called the random word exercise. Pick a word like headphone, like a wall, like eye contact, like ceiling, like holidays, and create random presentations out of thin air. And the reason we do this is because it serves two key purposes. One, Brian, because life is filled with uncertainty. So it helps us with it. Let me give you an example. When you're meeting somebody new at a genealogist event or something, or just in general at a party, you don't really know how that event is going to go or how that conversation is going to go. So if you do the random word exercise, like you invent words like avocado and you create presentations, you can create presentations out of anything. So that's the first piece. The second reason is if you can make sense out of nonsense, you could make sense out of anything. And that's really the benefit of doing the random word exercise. That's ball number one. Ball number two 
is the question drill. We get asked questions all the time in our life, Brian, at school, at work, on a podcast, or in when we're giving a presentation. But most of us are reactive to those questions. We're not proactive. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, when I started guesting on podcasts, I was really, really bad. I remember somebody asked me, Brian, where does the fear of communication come from? And I looked at the guy and I said, uh, Los Angeles? In New York City? I'm not really sure. So obviously I learned the lesson. So every single day, Brian, for five minutes, I answered one question, just one, that I thought the world would ask me about my expertise related to communication. So day one was, how do you, how do you overcome your fear of communication? Day two was, what tips do you have for introverts? And I kept doing that every single day. But if you do that for a year, Brian, and people can do this in your field, right? So in genealogy, think about all the questions that you get asked in your field or any questions that are about new trends in the future. Make a list of all of them and just answer a new one every single day. And if you do that for a year, you'll have answered 365 questions about genealogy. You'll be a master at your craft. And then exercise number three, which I don't think anyone in most fields do, which is simply just take out your phone and send video messages to the three people you love the most in your life, to your three favorite colleagues at work, and just wish them happy holidays for 20 seconds and just show appreciation for them. And those are my easy threes. Those are all three pretty easy things to, to do and the, put in the practice. And I can definitely see the, where they would be, be helpful. With public speaking, what are the the big questions that you usually do get asked. And now you've had, you've been doing this for what, five plus years, you said? So you should have 1,500 plus questions that you've asked yourself, but which ones of those do you find the most common? For sure, Brian, excellent question. So the first one is, of course, how do we practice more consistently every day, right? So we went through the easy threes, but now the next question that I often get is, Brendan, how do I overcome my fear of communication? How do I get over that? So there's a couple of thoughts that I have around this, Brian. The first one is understanding that the fear never really goes away. Like, let me give you an example. Let's say me and you are having lunch. We're having lunch, we're eating something, and somebody calls me, and I pick it up, and it's Elon Musk. And Elon Musk tells me, you know, Brian, I really liked your episode on Brian's podcast about genealogy. It's really good, and I like your YouTube channel. Can you coach me? I'll pay you a million dollars. Would I be scared? Yeah. Would I be worried about that? Of course. So even if I'm the expert, there's still things that I'm scared of. So for me, fear is always about managing the relationship, Brian. Not trying to remove the fear, but living with it and making sure the message is more important. Here is an example of what I mean. Communication is like a boxing ring. So one side of the ring is the fear, the anxiety, the stress, the, oh my God, I have to give another presentation to my genealogy association. I don't want to do this. And the other side of the ring is the message. Why does this matter? Why is this important to share with the world? And the goal, my friend, is not for the fear to leave the ring, but rather make sure that when your message and your fear meet in the middle of that boxing match, that your message gets the knockout punch, that your message wins the match. In the same way, for me, I had a bunch of excuses why I didn't want to start Mass Talk. I was really young at the time. I started coaching CEOs of massive companies. I was 19. I have a crooked left arm because of a surgery I had when I was younger. I grew up in Montreal, which means I spoke my whole life in a language I didn't know, which was French, whenever I got up on a stage. And you would think that a communication expert studied in communication, Brian. Yeah, I got a bachelor's degree in accounting, so probably not the best person to teach this. Yet, I believed that I should be the one to share this message. Why is that? Was it because I was fearless, Brian? Definitely not. The reason was because of the 15-year-old girl who can't afford a communication coach. What are we doing for her? And I realized, Brian, that nobody within my age range was creating content for her. Because the only alternative we have now on the internet is some 55-year-old PhD in communication who won't resonate with the younger generation. 
So it's either I make the videos or nobody does. And that message was way more important than the fear that it was attached to. So I just knocked out my fear every single day for the past seven going on eight years. And I'll keep doing it for the rest of my life. You basically kicked fear in the face and went on despite it. Absolutely. And and let's use you as an example, Brian. Like, did you have any fears or anxieties around starting your podcast or did you just come? Because I was scared when I started my YouTube channel. So what do you think? My fears weren't as much around the, the speaking aspect because I love to talk. <laughs> but uh, it was it was more about the what people want to listen that's my was my biggest fear sometimes today when i um do my podcast episodes or do my youtube channel videos you know i'm i'm doing it partially because of passion and partially because these are things i think people want to hear it's always that's my biggest fear is always that are am i just speaking about what i want to speak about absolutely brian and i had the same problem as well where I, because I didn't know that people wanted to watch, I mean, communication videos. Like, at, at least you got your genealogy group, a peer group, that'd be like, yeah, there's not really many podcasts about that. Let's listen to what Brian says. I didn't really have any of that. So there's actually a framework that I teach that maybe might be useful to you called QIT. So this stands for questions, insights, and titles. And even somebody who's not a content creator listening to this, you can apply this to in the context of your work, or let's say you're giving a genealogy presentation to your colleagues. So QIT just means questions. Make a list of all of the questions you get asked about your topic. So like you said, Brian, I've probably been asked 1,500 questions at this point. So for everyone listening, make a list of 10 to 15 questions before your genealogy presentation. Ask your colleagues, what are some of the questions all of you are curious around my topic? This is going to be my topic. What are you curious about? And just write those questions down. You don't need to be an expert. You just have dinner with them, get, get to know them, have breakfast with them, and just write those questions down. Then two stands for I, right? I stands for insights, which is you take a question every day, Brian, and you just write out a tiny answer, 50 words, 75 words, maybe 150 if you want to go crazy with it, and just write out your thoughts. But if you do that every day, the questions are going to get asked in your presentation. It will be really, really easy. And then the third part is T for titles. Then you want to title your content, title your speech, title your slides in a way that people want to read it and listen to you communicate your message. Simple as that, QIT. What about for the, the person that's just, I want to say they don't know how to tell a story. Um, you know, we, we've all been told stories and we've all told stories at one time or another, but there's a difference between stories that engage people and where you just have people wondering, okay, when is this going to get over? Excellent question, Brian, completely. So here's what I would say. I think the first step is to have fun with our communication skills, right? So when we think about communication, the key is, let's go back to that random word exercise we talked about earlier. A lot of people might write the exercise down, but they won't really do it. So I would start there. Let's say you've got the word genealogy, create a presentation out of it. Do you get the word rock, create a presentation out of that. Let's say you get ocean or wall or ceiling. And what this does is it helps you make sense out of nonsense and you start to have fun with this. I also encourage for those of you listening to this, you don't have to do it alone. You can do this with your kids. If you have families, you do this with your niece, your nephews. One thing I recommend my clients to do is when they're in a car, let's say they got young kids, instead of listening to music, Brian, I just force them to practice the random word exercise. They go, hey, kid, give me a random word. And then they practice it, and then they give the other person a random word. And that's how they rock and roll. And that's how they practice it more effectively. So now with that said, let's get into your second part, which is, Brendan, how do we start? How do we finish? How do we communicate this? Here's an easy way to think about this, Brian. I call it the jigsaw puzzle strategy. Communication and structuring presentations is like a jigsaw puzzle. You know those toy pieces you used to play as kids? Like you put it in the box, put it all together, and you get the puzzle. The question we need to now ask ourselves is when we work on a jigsaw puzzle, which pieces do we start with first and why? And a lot of us, we start with the edges first because they're easier to find in the box. 
It's easier to find the corners. Put the corners together, work your way into the middle. But the problem, unfortunately, Brian, is that in communication, we tend to do the opposite. We start the middle first. We shove a bunch of content in our presentations. We get to the presentation. We ramble throughout the whole thing. And then the last slide sounds something like this. Uh, yeah, so mm, thanks. Not the right approach. So instead, what you want to do is practice like a jigsaw puzzle. Start with the edges first. Practice just the introduction, nothing else. 20 to 25 times. That seems like a lot, but to be honest, your introduction's like 60 seconds, two minutes max, Brian. So you're really spending like 45 minutes doing this. Do the same thing with your conclusion. What's a great movie with a terrible ending? Last time I checked, terrible movie, right? So same thing with the close, then work your way into the middle. So now how does this tie into your question around how do we start? So in that 20 to 25 times that you're practicing your intro, one, you'll get really good at it, regardless of how it sounds. The second piece is now this is an opportunity for us to try different things. So the first intro you can try by opening with a personal story and not worry about it being good or not. Just try it. The third time, try starting with a powerful question. Who here loves genealogy in the room? Just, just be silly with it. The fourth time, try a statistic. The fifth time, try a metaphor. The sixth time, try a joke. And then as you're trying these different things, you're going to figure out which is the one you're the most comfortable with. And then that's what you end up presenting to the crowd. But the key is not to get stuck in one strategy, but rather have the open-mindedness of a five-year-old who's exploring the world and apply that same childlike mentality to communication. How do you take your story, I guess, uh, and build, build it out so you can condense it, but still make it worthwhile? What skills in the, the, the presentation, um, as far as to continue the, to keep people's interest and, and then again, with winding it down, sort of doing the review of what needs to, what, what your, your final words and what you want to leave them with. For sure, Brian. So a couple of thoughts there. I would say the first piece is really how do you structure the mail? Before we get there, let's talk a little bit about the psychology of puzzle. So here's what happens. A lot of the times when we have a presentation, let's say we spend three hours preparing for it, and it's a 30-minute talk. We might present the whole 30 minutes three times, and then what happens? We get tired, we get lunch, and then we don't practice again, then we present. That's what most of the time happens. Whereas a puzzle, what happens is you spend that first 30 minutes just working on the intro. So what happens? You start to get really excited. You go, wow, I've never really done my introduction 25 times before. Now I'm really good at communication. So now your energy levels go up. Your motivation goes up. Same thing with the conclusion. You start to spend 30 to 45 minutes doing the conclusion too. And then you go, wow, this introduction is so good. So then what happens is then when you tackle the middle, your energy is different around it. You're not just like, oh my God, I have to tackle the middle now. This sucks. You're like, wow, my intro is so good. My conclusion is so good. Now I'm motivated to tackle the middle. So we, so we need to pass through those steps. Then when that happens, let's tackle the middle. So the middle is four parts. One is the key idea. If there is only one thing that I can remember from your whole presentation, that's all I take away from this whole thing, what do you want it to be? Most people don't retain a lot of the information they hear when speaking. So even if you give the most intricate, detailed, amazing genealogy presentation for association, it doesn't matter. They won't remember 93, 95% of that. So it's about saying, if I can only get them to remember one thing, what do I want them to remember? So in my case for this podcast, I only have one goal. And the goal, Brian, is to inspire people to at least start working on their communication skills. That's my only thought. So I simplify my ideas. I simmer them down to such a simple level where people go, oh, like I know what a jigsaw puzzle is. Doing the intro 25 times is not that hard. Doing the easy threes, random word exercise, question drills, video messages. This is not hard. I could do this alone. So it inspires people to start. What's your key idea? Think about the next genealogy presentation you have to give and go, What's the point of this presentation? What do I want my colleagues, my employees, my teams to actually remember from this thing? 
That's the main idea. Then the last three is three to defend. So three to defend just means pick three stories, three analogies, three metaphors, three statistics, three of anything that you feel personally, personal stories that you feel defends that key idea the best. And the punchline here is you won't know the first time. So it goes back to what we did with the intro, Brian. We have to be willing to test different ideas. So for me, I tried a bunch of different things to try and get my point across. Hey, you know, if I could be a great speaker, you can too. But the problem I ran into early in my career, Brian, through failing a bunch of times, is yeah, Brennan, you're a great speaker, but I don't think I could be a great speaker like you. And I was like, why not? Like, yeah, but you're like a speaking coach. You're like an expert in this field. I can't do that. That's the complaint I would always get from my audience. So what did I do, Brian? Whenever I keynote, I always start with my personal story. Hey, guys, I had a broken left arm, and it's still broken to this day because of a surgery I had when I was younger. I spoke my whole life in a language I didn't know. I didn't come from a lot of money. I studied in literally the opposite of what you would think a communication expert studied in, which is accounting. If I can do it, why can't you? And that always resonates the most with people based on the feedback I get. But you only figure that out when you start testing. So that's my advice. Just test. So what I'm basing, I'm getting from you, and honestly, it's very simple, easy to understand things. You know, practice, practice, test. And when you practice, test to see what sounds good to you or you think sounds good, if I'm summarizing this right, and do it again until you to your you're comfortable with it and you're um you know you know what you want to say you, you're not worried about um struggling for the the words or the the phrases you might use because uh, they'll come second nature and by doing the question thing you 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 know you've prepared yourself for the the questions that might come up um, cause I'm hoping if you were giving a presentation, those times when you're practicing those questions, you're doing one specifically, you know, if you, if you have 30 days, you're doing it 30 days time, you're doing it with those questions in mind to that's that speech. Um, yeah, no, really great stuff. Uh, Brendan, um, I really enjoyed talking to you. I learned uh, a lot myself and I'm hoping this is a value. Um, to my audience, it's like I said, it's a little different than I normally do. Um, I'm usually talking to people and getting them to share their stories. Uh, so I thought it was a good opportunity to get somebody to talk about how you can share your stories better. Um, with that in mind, um, what's the the one takeaway that you would want uh, somebody that was listening today to to get to to challenge themselves or to make themselves a better speaker if they hear that one thing what is it for sure brian absolutely the tip is very simple it's a question how would your life change if you were an exceptional communicator you know the problem with most of this field that i'm in is that a lot of communication is is laced in fear in stress and anxiety and ugh, i don't want to do this i don't want to do this this sucks and that's not the way we're supposed to approach it. Communication is about leading a more fulfilling life. We dream about our businesses. We dream about our careers, our families, our relationships, our health. When was the last time we dreamed about a world in which we're a better communicator in it? So I would encourage your audience to dream about their communication skills because it's so much more than making a little extra money at work. It's the way that you talk to your family. It's the way that you raise your children. It's the way that you make new friends. It's the way that you order food at a restaurant and make the waiter feel like they're the most important person in the world, even if they're having a terrible day. And that's really the key. When we realize communication is about improving the quality of one's life and the lives of others, we take it more seriously and we might just do the random word exercise. Well, thank you very much, Brendan. Great talking to you today. And I, like I said, I hope people that are listening got some value and um, they, they'll put in what you've had in the practice. If they want to find out more, um, you mentioned your YouTube channel. Uh, if there's one video there that they should start with, what is it? 
For sure, Brian. Thanks for that, and it's great being on your show. So there's two ways to keep in touch. The first one is the YouTube channel, and the video I'd always recommend for Master Talks, you just type Master Talk in one word, and you'll have access to all the videos for free, is my three daily public speaking exercises. It's my, my most popular video, and you can start implementing that right away, like we talked on the podcast. The second way to keep in touch is to attend one of my free Zoom calls, which is a free communication workshop that I run live every two weeks. And you could see me applying the tips and it's absolutely free. You just jump on the Zoom call and you just listen and learn. So if you want to jump on that, go to rockstarcommunicator.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Brendan. And we'll talk to you again, hopefully sometime. Of course. Thanks, Brian. Thank you for listening to this episode of How We Got Here. Make sure you check out the show notes for more information about today's topic and guests. How We Got Here is hosted and produced by Brian Nash. Title music from Tribute to O'Carolan by Luna Bajowski. 